Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise and hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord Jesus. Now, I feel like the Lord has laid it upon my heart to take a look at a often overlooked book, one that you may have never read or studied, and yet it is a book that has so many applications to us as God's people. Why? Because we are just like the children of Israel. We make a commitment to serve the Lord, yet we find ourselves falling back into our old ways. What comes natural for us? What seems and feels comfortable? And so I want to introduce you to a minor prophet. If you're familiar with the layout of the Old Testament, you know that once you get past the wisdom books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, you get into the major prophets and then the minor prophets. And the major prophets are considered the major prophets for the length of the book and for the position that they held among the people of Israel. And so most often when you see the smaller books in the Old Testament, Joel, Amos, Habakkuk, Obadiah, Micah, Malachi, these small books are the minor prophets. And so I want to introduce you today to one of the minor prophets by the name of Hosea. Now my position is not going to be one of historical value, intellectual knowledge, but rather I want to take the practical applications that we can draw from and put into our own personal lives that will help our walk, our journey with the Lord Jesus. And while there are some who can make the claim from the day they began to serve the Lord Jesus, they never went back to their old ways, the ways of the world. For most of us, we have to hang our heads in guilt and shame because we know that we are guilty of returning to our old ways. And that's what the book of Hosea is all about. Hosea chapter 1 begins, The word of the Lord came unto Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. These were the kings of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, who was the king of Israel. Now, I may not be exact on this, but I know that there was a time where the 12 tribes were divided. And when they were divided, 10 of the tribes went south, two of the tribes went north. The two tribes that went north were Benjamin and Judah. Now, Judah is the line that Jesus came from, the tribe that Jesus came from, which tells us that Jesus was a Jew, not a Christian. Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. He came to open up new opportunities and new paths for God's original people which was always, by the way, not only the Jews, but any who would surrender to the commands and the judgments and the statutes of the Most High and that would live according to his purpose and will. So the door was always open to anyone who would leave their old ways behind and worship the one true living God, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord of Israel, and the God of the hosts of the armies of heaven. Now, I say all this to remind you that the 10 tribes that went south rebelled against the Lord and continued in their pagan practices. But the two tribes that went north, Benjamin and Judah, they succumbed to the word of the Lord and they did everything in their power to serve the God of Israel. And so God being in a relationship with his people divorces the 10 tribes that went south, which is known when you read your Bible as the tribes of Israel. The tribes of Judah remained in a relationship with him. Now, I've done another video on this that I would encourage you, highly encourage you to watch. And if I remember right, it's entitled, Why Did Jesus Die? It's Not What You Think. And you'll find it in the playlist under Miscellaneous Truth. And it's important that we understand this because Jesus, when he arrived on the scene, he said, I come for the lost tribes of the house of Israel. And he's talking about those tribes that were divorced from the Almighty. And so they had to be reconciled. They had to be brought back into a relationship with the Lord. And so we're at a time in history when this division has taken place 
and we see that there are four kings that are ruling in Judah, and there is one king that rules over Israel. Now, verse 2 says, The Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So God tells Hosea, this prophet of the Lord, to take a wife who is playing a life of harlotry. And he does this for a very significant reason, which we'll point out later. It continues in verse 3 and says, So he went, and he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived, and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel, because God's going to divorce these ten tribes. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she, Gomer, conceived again, Hosea's wife, and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name lo for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Now when she, Gomer, Hosea's wife, had weaned lo she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, Call his name lo for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Now this is a very sad day for the people of Israel, because God is cutting them off. He has had enough. It's been thousands of years of wayward living, constant backsliding, continual rebelling. And so God says, enough is enough. Now there are those friends who walk this earth and have rejected the rule of God in their lives so constantly, so consistently, that God has cut them off. And that shows you the condition of their hearts, because God is a patient God. He's been patient with you. He's certainly been patient with me. I'm not one who can say, I've lived faithfully from the day I met the Lord. I drifted back on many occasions and went back to the ways of the world, and I'm deeply ashamed of it. Yet God in his patience, his mercy, and his compassion continued to woo my soul back to him. And if you're in my position, so he has done with you. Yet we must be very careful testing the patience of the Lord because there comes a day when he says, enough is enough. And that's what we see in this story, in this illustration, because this is a physical example of a spiritual truth. And so for instance, when the Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery, that applies spiritually as much as it does physically. When we go back to the world in which we have been delivered from, we're committing spiritual adultery against the Lord. And that's what Israel has done here. And that's why God says, enough is enough. You are not my people and I will not be your God. Continuing in verse 10, Yet the number of the children of Israel, the combination of all these ten tribes, shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured by number. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. So here is a promise that the reconciliation will take place, but it's not going to be for many years to come. Verse 11, then shall the children of Judah, the other two tribes that went north, and the children of Israel, the ten tribes, combining to make the twelve tribes of Israel, they will be gathered together and they will appoint themselves one head. They won't have separate kings, but they will come together in unity. They will come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Now again, God is trying to make a point spiritually, a spiritual truth to us reading this story and even to them that day. And so he tells the prophet of God to marry a harlot to signify the unfaithfulness that the people of God have shown unto their God. 
In the same way that Gomer will show her unfaithfulness to Hosea is a picture of our unfaithfulness instead of serving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength being bent toward backsliding and constantly going back to our old ways. Now, this is simply an introduction this morning into a more complete, fuller story and picture that we're going to see in the next coming days. And we're going to see that in the relationship Gomer has with Hosea, Hosea has with Gomer, so we're going to see ourselves in our relationship with God the Almighty and with God the Almighty in his relationship to us. Will we be cut off? Will we be cast to the side? Or will there be mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and love offered unto us? Well, we'll have to wait for tomorrow to answer that question. But I trust as you examine your heart today and you ponder these things and that you'll look back in your relationship with God and you will see that as in any relationship, your failure only makes you stronger, makes you less proud and more humble and makes you fight even harder to prove your loyalty and earn back the trust that you so foolishly cast away. May your day be blessed today, friend. May you walk with the Lord Jesus, forgetting the things that are behind, learning from them, but not being haunted by them, and that you'll press on to reach the goal that is set before you. And that as John chapter 17, verse 3 tells us, we will truly know God the Father and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Now, as he wills, and until tomorrow, friends, I love you. I'll see you on the next video.